G'day everyone, welcome to Talking Leadership. This is Eric Perez welcoming you back to the Emerging Leader podcast series. And today I'm being joined after a busy day at work by my guest this afternoon. And just as a bit of a background, my guest today is the founder of IARN. And I'd like to welcome to the program Lachlan Lockie Cook. How are you, uh, Lockie? I'm going very well, thanks, Eric. Mate, look, I appreciate your time. I know you're busy. We're all busy in this crazy world. Um, but this, this this series of podcasts is particularly important uh, to me because even though I've got 20 years on you, mate, um, I want to know what emerging leaders are thinking and you definitely fall into that category. So can you explain for the listeners of the podcast just what um, IARN is and how you got involved? Yeah, no, thanks, Eric. Um, I guess Ion, um, the the concept came, has been brewing in me over the last decade, really. Um, I set up a youth organisation when I was 16 and ran that uh, for about 10 years. And through that, I got exposed to a lot of Indigenous community up in the Ariola or One Arm Point community in the Kimberley. And part of the journey of being, um, of setting up the organisation, I got adopted by the community. And um, and one family in particular, the Ejai family, brought me into their family and uh, I learned the ways of the Bardi people. And one of the big parts of Bardi culture is, is Leon. And Leon is the word for body, emotion, mind, spirit, soul, your everything. And it's part of a core cool way of communicating with peers. So say when, if I've been out of the community for a while, they'd say, oh, how's your Leon? And um, it's disrespectful to your law, your culture, your community, your family, if you're not truly honest in that moment. So um, yeah, that was a great thing. So whenever I went in the community, I had to go true, honest and say, oh, you know, if I got a heavy heart or a light heart and I'm feeling good. And I was thinking, wow, how awesome is that? Um, you know, in this community, it's given me so much to have this new way to communicate. And I thought, far out, this would just be amazing for me to bring into my, you know, Gadia, um, my white fellow ways and my white family and my Western kind of communities um, further south in Perth and, and other parts of Australia. So, you know, we put a bit of a spin on Leon and we call it Iyan. So I-Y-A-R-N. So Iyan, it's all about connecting people with themselves and others. Um, and essentially it's a digital platform um, that p- promotes wellness and, and staff engagement and community engagement. Um, so it's a bit of a survey uh, way around connecting in with peers, both yourself and others, um, in a more deeper and meaningful way. Wow. Okay. So for the uh, for the sake of the listeners, that's probably the most um, <coughs> introduction to a podcast I've had uh, since starting this thing. Wow, that's amazing. So um, you ran that organisation. So you've kind of answered my first question when you took on your first leadership role. Obviously, doing what you've done in the community has that in spades. But just just by way of exa- by way of example from your experiences, mate, what what do you feel is the most critical leader capability in, in the leaders that you've encountered in your travels and, and for, for yourself personally? I think over time my um my ability to kind of tr- answer this question has like evolved as I've become more um, exposed to other leaders, but also I've been had the opportunity to be um, immersed in being some kind of leader in a certain task that I get given. And I think one of the biggest things um, for me is uh, the ability to listen um, and, 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 and listen deeply and, and ask the second and third question. I think they're the true parts, the true parts of that and then be able to stop, meditate on it um, and then actually take action. Um, I think that's the crucial part because if you don't have that fundamentally, um, no matter what you do, um, it's not necessarily going to be relevant to your constituents or the people you're trying to lead. Um, so I think that's um, fundamental to being a good leader is listening. Sure. And that, um, that segues quite nicely into the next uh, lot of questions around what, what your thoughts are in your travels around this concept of strategic thinking and foresight and you've kind of gone into the third one which i I ask about communication communication that's definitely listening and being able to take in what others have to say but in in your travels what what what's your thoughts on strategic thinking um i i see strategic thinking is the ability to um to take in all your experiences um and the ideas on the table and then come 
and try to remove yourself from previous judgment um, because all of a sudden that's truly being immersed in that um, idea because sometimes say if you get brought in as a facilitator you don't want to be bringing in your um, baggage into that room you want to be bringing the, everyone's thoughts um, and experiences and ideals to that because everyone's had a different experience um, but then if you are thinking say strategically on something you're working you've got to take on all those personal experiences and put them down um, so I think strategic thinking is you know I, thought, I actually think it's crucial um, strategic thinking to be quite a meditative um, kind of thing like you've got to be it's all about focus um, and I think some people see the action of doing and being busy and getting caught up um, with strategy. Um, I think the biggest part of strategy, which has been, you know, really taught to me from um, one of my um, party elders, a guy called Nolan Hunter, who's the CEO of the Kimberley Land Council. He's been the CEO for the last eight years. And just seeing how he thinks strategically and how he thinks slowly and, and um, very mindful of other people's considerations and other organisations um, and things like that to really get the full picture and not just a convenient short-term picture is actually the full um, picture of the whole community because then it's going to create greater outcomes for the whole. And um, and I, I, I truly think that's been where I've seen the most uh, strategic th uh, thinking um, through mentors that I've had. Yeah. Oh, okay. That, thank you for sharing that because that, that extends the definition a little <coughs> of what's been um, provided before to me around what people think about it because there is never a right or wrong answer here but you you've stretched out this meaning of strategic thinking to look at the environment in which you work in and not just the environment but i, I, I think i heard you mention uh, taking into account those that are in that environment that may be affected by what you do and that that's that's one of those um those next steps when you're when you're talking about uh strategic thinking not just strategy where you're, you're trying to map out a course that that hopefully doesn't impede on other other people or other organisations. So no, that that's quite a that's quite a um a, a critical piece of learning, I guess. Um, one one thing yeah. as and as, I think there's oh, no no you, you go, go you go mate you go. Well, I was just thinking there. Like I do find the strategic thinking in different. I think what lens you're looking through. Like say, what is the you know you got to get clear. What is the desired outcome? of this and a lot of you know when i've kind of done work more commercially it's around really how do we create the best ecosystem or environment for us to make more money so how do we become aware of our competitors and find the arbitrage opportunities and then it, you know essentially export them um that strategic thinking so being as aware as you can of the environment away but then taking advantage of the gaps in the market whereas strategic thinking on a community development level is not necessarily around um seizing the, op the gaps in the market and jumping on them and, and, and reaping the profits is actually about getting everyone collectively engaged in that strategy so everyone's working cooperatively towards the, the outcome, the joint goal. And I think the way in stakeholder engagement, you've got to be quite mindful around working those two different kind of, kind of uh, economies, really, um, community development or um, more traditional Western economies. Um, so yeah, I think I've got to bring that and be aware what hat I'm wearing when I'm doing strategic work with organisations. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. So again, this uh, melds quite nicely into the next area in terms of leader capability, and that's foresight. So being able to sort of look into the future and, and plan a pathway to a goal, be that uh, you know one day ahead, five years ahead, uh, one year ahead. What, what what's your view on foresight? As a, as a leader capability? I think it's crucial um, to have a, have uh, be led by a purpose and a, and a vision for what you're doing. Um, and, that, and that foresight has no real um, end point or time, um, I think, because that's, and then that's fueled by the values um, that you're the code of conduct. Um, but then you've got to have milestones in place um, to kind of be able to check in that you are on track to uh, inevitably achieving that vision. So I think the vision side of things, it's ne there's no real end point to that. Um, but then on a, on a foresight um, in the sense of uh, goal setting and milestones, I think it's crucial for you to have that. So you've got a bit of a roadmap 
um, to the journey to achieving that vision. But then on the flip side of that, it's also crucial that you are truly got your, you know, I call it head in the sky, feet on the ground. So you able to think strategically with uh, the vision of the, the goals or milestones you wish to achieve, but then also got your feet on the ground and truly listening to what's happening on the ground and how, you know, your organization or business or whatever is, is a, on track to achieving those things or do you need to slightly pivot or slightly amend the process to getting there you know because i think you know it goes and dibs and flows um so you don't want to be too reactional you've got to be quite resilient in your journey to achieving those milestones but also you've got to be a bit um humble in the sense to say hey maybe that thinking that we had three months ago um is different because of the experiences we've had today so we're going to have to slightly amend these milestones uh, to be able to get there and achieve them. Sure. Look, uh, well, just out of curiosity, because you, you did mention a, a strong uh, connection to um, Indigenous culture, is there a lot of discussion or just talking about what a possible futures might look like in Indigenous cultures from your experiences? Or is it more about living in the now? Or is it more about veneration of the past? Like what on that spectrum, where 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 does your experience in communities lie? lie? Um, no, I think it's a really good question, and you know, I'm not going to say I've got you know, all the answers. It's a very the challenge of facing a lot of Indigenous Australians. It's a wicked pro, um, challenges associated from um, colonisation in Australia, and there's a lot of uh, and a variety of different ways around how that's affected Indigenous Australians that are overrepresented in so many. Um, adverse things in 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 in, in, in socially in our country. Um, however, in my mind, where things are at in on a broad, broadly, I think there's a real theme around uh, self determination and agency. Um, there's a lot of uh, Marsha Langton, Noel Hunter, and Noel Pearson, and a lot of other uh, leaders, Indigenous leaders in the space, believe that um, the way out of a lot of the disadvantages Indigenous people are facing in the, in 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 the country is through self determination. Um, and agency. So that's essentially owning, um, you know, uh, being um, in the driver's seat of the things that happen to them, which is kind of seems to be, you know, uh, um, quite obvious to a lot of people. But the challenge is in community, a lot of things that get done in community um, happen for them rather than engage in that process. So, you know, there's a lot of figures around how much billions of dollars is thrown into Indigenous affairs every year. But the true ownership on the allocation of those resources and funding isn't doesn't end um, being with the Indigenous people, um, and there is a real disconnect with that money and where it goes. Um, so I think the big part moving forward with Indigenous community is this idea of self determination and agency, and one of the most um, tangible ways in in living that is through um, uh, business and enterprise. Um, and one of the challenges why Indigenous people haven't really had that is access to capital. Um, and and th and uh, and that's been one of the big things that I've been pushing on with the Kimberley Land Council um, and other Indigenous groups in the north um, is having access to capital. So then, you know, owning businesses and earning income and generating uh, more resources to then be able to give back to the community, create jobs, and these jobs are all culturally appropriate. And I think that's kind of where. Um, in my mind, in my experience and what I immerse in is that's where a lot of the focus is at to progressing um, a lot of the challenges that Indigenous Australians do face today. Okay, wow. The, the, thank you for sharing that. And again, I, I, I ask this as someone who has not had um, much experience with our Indigenous community. So I appreciate you sharing that. But look, I want to take you to an area around um, discussing emerging versus established leaders so what what do you believe an emerging leader like yourself brings to the table that established leaders don't necessarily bring um it's an interesting question i saw this and i think emerging leaders have the ability to um and i think they'll uh really truly be successful if they're quite agile with their thinking um and they're open to new learnings um i kind of look at this as being quite um you know emerging leader um i think it's an ongoing journey for someone um, I, I think if you start getting uh, feel like you're an established leader and you already um, are established with your mindset, you end up being quite fixed and not agile. And I think that ends up working against you, particularly in the ever-evolving 
highly competitive um, environment, um, both non-for-profits, commercial, um, you know, for-profit organisations. So I kind of see that um, if I saw anyone seeing themselves as an established leader, I'd see that as a bit of a red flag. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the amazing leaders I've come across um, have a lot of their, um, the spirit of an emerging leader um, at front of mind and willing to op- come to conversations with an open mind and things like that. But in saying that, on the, on the, on the flip side, established leaders, I can see are quite stoic um, in their thinking. Um, and they're quite clear of, um, you know, uh, of from their experiences to date. They're very aware of how things um, unfold, and that is very valuable in a leadership role. So I don't think it's one or the other, um, but I think it's also really crucial for people, um, leaders, full stop, to be um, try not to be fixed with their mindset and try to be as open as they can, but then grounded with um, a bit of a guiding philosophy from experience to date. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that response, mate, because one of the things that I hadn't thought about until you've just answered this question, this was a unique way to answer it, was um, looking at emerging versus established almost like on a um, on a continuum. And that's not necessarily where my headspace was at, but I think that's an assumption that I've made in asking that question. And it's not, it's not, not done on purpose, but thank you for uh, the response because I guess if, if you're going to be a leader as an ongoing part of your career, which could, in your case, you'll probably be doing this for the next 40 or 50 years, mate. So uh, <laughs> not not being open to learning and not having an open mind will probably set you up for failure more than success, I would say. And I'm, and I'm only basing that on what I'm seeing. Um, has the industry you've worked in shaped your leadership? Now, um, can you clear up for me the industry sector that you work in? So is it... Is it community engagement? Is the is sector? Is it what what sector do you primarily work in? Yeah, well, I think yeah, the question industry. I, I I feel very lucky to have been dabbled in a bunch of different industries, sure. um, and I think it's really kind of expanded my awareness around leadership um, in each one, um, and actually the concept of leadership is universal around, you know, believing, um, having a clear vision, having a, a clear. Um, uh, kind of code of conduct um, is crucial to being a good leader. Um, but in the one that I essentially I see myself in now, it's kind of in the health and wellbeing space. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty new into it, but I believe the concepts um, of having a vision, having clear values, I think will, uh, will, will um, assist me to be the most effective leader in the space um, that I can be. Brilliant. Okay, let's, let's go on to the next area, which is leader development. I just want to ask you, in, in your travels, what have you done to upskill, um, enhance your um, learning, professional development around this thing called leadership? Oh, it is um, so crucial uh, to immerse yourself in content um, in, 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 and immerse yourself in other people's experiences and teachings. Um, I go, I've gone through a bit of uh, uh, immerse myself in a bunch of different forms of education from personal development um, uh, audio tapes to immersive workshops to uh, week-long camps um, and and different courses. Um, you know, I did an undergraduate in business, uh, major in finance and accounting, um, but then that kind of led on to other things. And I think one of the big things that gets missed a lot, like um, for a lot of young, uh, like uh, in your words, emerging leaders, young people kind of coming through the ranks to become established leaders. I think... Um, if you go down the path and getting into a graduate program with one of the large, larger organisations like Westfields or that, or Westfield um, or, uh, or not Westfield, sorry, um, West Farmers or a large bank or something like that, I think their programs are awesome. But they've got uh, you know structured educational leadership development programs, and you know if I had someone who really believes in wanting to really develop up a real sound foundation of leadership skills for organisations. I couldn't um, advocate for that more. I think they, uh, they've they obviously got some of the smartest people in the world to kind of develop these programs. And I think on the flip side, it makes it a bit tougher for those other emerging young leaders who are kind of going into the smaller SME space, um, you know, uh, companies with, you know, less than 50 people, things like that, I think they don't really have the same ability to invest in that per, in that development. So it comes up to the individual to seek that development. And I think this is where 
there's a big um, uh, challenge for you know young Australians and emerging leaders um, uh, that all the leaders who come through the system in 20 years time or 15 years time then they're not kind of um, brought up solely in one lens from you know the wet uh, the, the west west farmers or the banking kind of situation there's actually people coming through coming with a lived experience from smes um which represent like you know 70 percent of all australians who work um and i think that's um there's a bit of a gap there um so that's why i kind of say a lot of people who i know have kind of gone through that just really advocate for you gotta you know you can't expect the organization to give it to you you've got to seek it yourself um, so for me personally, it's ranged from like literally, you know, I've got onto the personal development audiobooks with buddy, you know, Tony Robbins. I haven't attended the workshops, but I've have um, listened to the tapes. I've done a lot of leadership development um, work. Uh, but one of the biggest things that's come up with the leadership development work is actually being able to un, um, un peel the layers of your own baggage. Um, what I've realised is that really to be the most effective leader you've got to kind of get rid of you're bringing the baggage to the discussion to the room to the organization and a lot of to be the most effective leader leader i believe you've got to kind of um unpack all your kinks um in self-awareness to be the most effective leader that's kind of where i've come to now which is um early on if you, you know i didn't i didn't think that but i've kind of come to a point now and realizing shit the most effective leaders i've seen are, are the most uh, the greatest amount of self-awareness and self-leadership, um, which truly allows them to be the best leaders. So I think the development that you can do to be an effective leader is actually development in yourself and self-awareness, number one. And then all the strategies to be an effective communicator and all that can come downstream. But I think actually number one is actually self-awareness. Yeah, that that's, um, again, that's exceptionally insightful. And I guess it's not, it's not an age thing and when you can sort of um, sit there and, and unpack that stuff or you talk about your own personal baggage when you, when it comes into that, um, that leadership space, because like, like you've mentioned before, we're, we're working with um, human beings and you're working in different size organizations and um, it's, it's the real world, it's real people. And it's a little, it's a step once removed from the book. So it, it's, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned things like those self help books and, things like Tony Robbins because others have mentioned that offline and, and said, look, we, um, if you're well read on leadership, then you try and read as much as you can from different perspectives because you won't agree with everything necessarily, but you take out what you can use. And I think that, that if I had to write my own book on this, I think the, some of the best leaders I've now spoken to, um, through the podcast process and in my own travels are those that have, have been practical and pragmatic enough to pick, the best bits of what might work for them and apply it to the settings that they're in to make, make them be able to, to achieve whatever it is they need to achieve. So yeah, mate, look, I appreciate you sharing that. So again, nice segue into the next question. Do you, do you have a, a view on lifelong learning, mate? Um, do I have a view on lifelong learning? I, yeah, I think it's essential. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, yep. Is that, is that kind of uh that, yeah, that, that's I, a good answer. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I, I guess uh, lifelong learning. I think if you don't, um, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Um, sure. You know, and I think that's the same. I think that's the one thing that unites us as people is that you are ongoingly, um, you know, living um, consciously is through learning. Um, sure. Not, yeah. not, not everyone thinks that way though, and that that's that's one of the things that. Um, and I've not asked this before, but I, I will ask it now. Is do you think the best leaders that you've encountered are ones that embrace that as as just part of their DNA that they're going to learn something or will take take something from the environment and do something with with it that will enhance them as professionals? Yeah, well, I think in a way, like I think you know, I think it, 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 you retro. Sorry, <laughs> um, right. I'm getting tongue twisted. I think it really is quite a thing that unites it. Like I think a lot of um, you know, say I'm talking my lens of like, say, from my experience with Indigenous communities and then, you know, from more of a, like a Western philosophy around science um, compared to, you know, some uh, leadership which may be based around spirituality. I think um, the thing that unites them both is, a, is this idea around focus, extreme focus on your craft, whatever it is. If you're a shaman, 
um, or if you're a scientist or a CEO. You know, it's an extreme level of focus on whatever it is you're doing. And I think with that extreme level of focus, you get extreme level of awareness. And then that awareness flows into reflection. And then that reflection flows into um, uh, being um, truly uh, the most effective you can be in that moment. Um, whether you're connecting with someone else, um, a certain challenge that gets thrown on you, um, and, uh, and, and it essentially it affects the way you react to certain situations. So, um, you know, in the, in the spirit of that, I think, um, you know, you're truly always learning. And if you're not doing that, you're kind of just, um, you know, drifting on by as time goes by, um, you know. So, yeah, I hope that kind of un unites everyone, I think, is this ongoing uh, a way around extreme focus, which then flows into, um, you know, growth. That's really deep. And I don't know, I haven't really articulated that like that before, but I think it is the, something that truly does unite all people is this idea of um, true focus. And I believe that when you truly focus on something, you are always growing. Yeah, that that's um, that's that's quite a... Again, quite an insightful view of that. And and look, I, I think um, to be fair, uh, depending on your your context and the the kind of cultural background you bring to this. So I I for a long time thought maybe my cultural background didn't impact on how I looked at the leadership question because you've you've mentioned quite strongly your connection to um, your country, your connection to the indigenous community that you've been. Um, adopted by and it sounds like it's it's had quite a profound effect on not just how you view the world but this particular topic around uh, leadership and it's it's something that I want to look at into the future is that sense of well, where your culture is does it affect it how you you lead so for example I'm I have a, a Latino uh, cultural background and family is a very important Thing, but not just your immediate family those that you bring in that are extended family whether they're blood relations or not quite is quite uh, a strong theme uh, at least in my community or the, the people uh, from, from which I hail from and uh, that, that impacts quite a lot what I do as a leader because after a certain amount of time once you get to know people and uh, this, this is always a danger in the advocacy space so I work in that space is that you move from being a dispassionate advocate to being an advocate because you you form relationships or have bonds with the people that you represent and that can yeah uh, that can make for quite a telling um work experience because you move to a space that's not that um that's sitting on the fence so to speak and you, you do take on the the woes and the troubles of those you represent i think that makes for a better advocate but i think sometimes too it makes for a better human being because if you can't empathize with the people you're working with and you're not really of much value that that's just a personal view um and, and it can have an impact on you going forward so for those in advocacy work if you, if you're feeling stressed talk to people um i've found that more and more in my travels the more you can sort of stop and talk to someone about what it is that you're doing um so yeah look sorry for going off on that tangent but again this is why we have this is why i'm doing these podcasts because the discussion has been quite um, a good one and you kind of met uh, you kind of addressed my next question around leadership models and mentoring so have you had mentors um, in the past and has it been more a formal thing or an informal thing and what have you thought of that Lockie? Yeah well I think mentors for me has been my biggest kind of teacher um, you know I think a books and all those have come but the mentors have been there for a bit of wise counsel um, to support me um, as I am you know an emerging leader, young person, you know, and I think you can, you know, they, they, there's a saying, you know, I, I can have B at the table because I stand on the shoulders of giants or, you know, and that's a cool saying because, you know, you can be a lot taller than you actually are because you stand on the knowledge and experiences of your mentors. And I think, um, you know, that's what my mentors have allowed me to do. Um, and that's why I think I've been uh, my leadership journey has been accelerated as a result of that through a real genuine relationship and true trust um, and uh, a mutual willingness to be vulnerable and a mutual interest to learn off each one another and I think that's what's been really powerful but in saying that I feel very privileged I haven't been through any kind of formal mentoring or anything like that 
And I think um, they do tend to happen naturally. Um, and I think it, 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 and it's just putting yourself out there to be um, for, you know, they say when the mentee is ready, the mentor will come. Um, and I think that's something that I've been very conscious of. Um, and I think I'm fortunate I've been exposed to that early on in my journey, you know, which is essentially made. And this is really the reason why I've kind of, one of the big reasons why I set up Ion, because I believe there's a lot of people who may not have been, you know, they're, in a, they're established leaders, um, but then they don't necessarily know how to be a good mentor. Um, so that's why I've got Ion there, so it can be used as a bit of a conversation canvas to assist mentors to ask better questions and, and, and also mentees to be better um, be able to connect with their mentors more and be able to deeply connect. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. No, no, I was just uh, <clears throat> about the, the, that when you talk about um, what are the, the best questions to ask. I, I never thought of it in that, taking that perspective. And uh, again, all of our experiences are unique to us, but there's also that commonality across leaders of, of, with their experiences. And uh, I've got to say, most of the responses to this question around mentoring has been more informal than formal. I mean, it exists and you can have formal mentoring programs and for busy people that, that kind of arrangement might suit. But, um, you know, mentoring can happen on, on, on different scales. So um, would you say in your travels your mentors are people more that are much older than you or do you pick your mentors? Does age is not an issue? Like, is that... Um, and why I ask this is that um, I, I sometimes will draw on someone that I know has been in the workforce for a lot longer than I have and be able to draw from, from what I call their wisdom in their travels as a leader versus being able to just go to some of my peers and say, hey, what do you think about this? Because I, I, I want that sort of next level of thinking and I base that primarily and, and I, I may get shot down for this is I think experience is one of the best teachers out there so someone who's been in a job for 30 40 years has got a wealth of, of wisdom that they can share and tapping into that is important at least from my perspective is that what you found when you're talking to your mentors um totally yeah i think i think you really hit it on the head there like i see you know reaching out to a group of people for some specific answers on a certain challenge um it kind of it's like that you know the first layer of the onion but i think a mentor you know, conversation kind of does go, you know, a good mentor allows you to go deeper and you can really tap into that wisdom. Um, so, yeah, I really agree with you saying that. But I also think um, I've got a, a, a real diverse array of mentors. I wouldn't say I've got one. I've got probably, you know, 15 mentors who I can call upon on different areas. Yep. So, say in the Indigenous community, I've got someone who thinks very strategically on a, organizational level um such as the ceo of the kimberley land council but then i've also got a mentor with someone who's a case manager um in ideal and one arm point community who works with you know 15 to 20 young people every day um i see them as a mentor because they've got real on the ground experience connecting with kids and i wouldn't say there's one's more valuable than the other um and then i kind of would say you know like someone like a fred cheney who's an ex deputy um leader of the opposition and, and he um you know minister for indigenous affairs um you know him on a political level and then i've got someone who's like a founder of a tech company who i meet up with every fortnight um and have you know hour-long conversations with so i think it's also very important that you don't get the full picture of the world through one lens on their experience i think um you know if you've got one mentor i wouldn't say that you're sorted i think you've also sure. you've got to be really yeah um i think you've got to be really conscious aware around you know what um you know what uh area do you want kind of that mentorship in um because everyone's got their baggage you know like you know not everyone is perfect and i think um you want to be really open you listen you learn and you engage and tap into that wisdom but you also want to be you know you don't want to be all of a sudden brought up with one person's um picture of the world sure. you end up just being a bit of a um you know, uh, a reflection of who they are. <laughs> um, that, that, that view that view you brought up is quite a quite a, a present one for most leaders. So, for example, in the industry that I work in, all of my equivalent CEOs in the states have been quite a magnificent source of mentoring for me. Even though they won't see themselves that way, because we're as I say, we're, we're all colleagues. No, no one's a mentor here, but 
I view the those relationships in that way, even though they're they're informal in that I can draw on their experiences and I don't necessarily agree with everything they may have to say and nor they of me, but um, you can tell the strengths of those relationships by how, how much people seek your counsel and stuff or just if the question is posed, hey, what do you think of this, that or the other, then um, it can create a strong network for you to be able to draw on because I'd, like you say, um, no one's got all the right, all the, all the answers are let alone the right answers. Look, yeah. The, um, for a final question here, and this one is of, of interest to me and um, I'm sure you can have an interesting answer to this. Leaders are born, not made. Yeah. <laughs> um, I saw this one. And it, it gets me thinking so many different ways. Like I think, um, but then I also think a lot, there's a lot of different archetypes of individuals. Like some people are very content to, um, you know, be behind um, the scenes and, and, and leading in a different way. And I think it, it kind of comes down to what you see as being a leader. And I think, you know, a leader could be the accountant who, does the number crunching in an organization, but doesn't necessarily, and that's their form of leadership. Um, so I think um, <laughs> I find it really hard to kind of say one or the other. I think, um, I think a community does um, create strong leaders. Um, and I think that's kind of what they're, they're uh, born. And then also the individual can seek um, greater leadership um, skills so they can kind of make themselves a better leader. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's I okay. Man. There's nothing. There's nothing wrong in saying that you're on the fence on this one because some. Yeah. Uh, again, there's there's never a right and wrong answer to this. So I'm, I, I I I constantly sway between the podcast whether I'm for one or for the other. And maybe you don't need to make a choice on this. Maybe it's about well, you know, sometimes they they may be born or sometimes they're made. The circumstances versus those people that you'll meet in your, in your life that it just naturally attract people to them. Yeah. That, um, uh, have got those natural skill sets for whatever reason they've got them and they, they didn't need any amount of training to get there. So no, nah, mate, that that's all good. Look, well, I think being born as a leader, can get you to a certain degree, uh, to a certain level. Um, but you know, and then it kind of gets to a certain level and then it kind of, um, plateaus off, but it, you can, you know, increase your leadership capacity. Um, through you know immersing yourself in and learning more so yeah I think it's not one or the other um, a bit on the fence but I think um, leaders are born um, can only get you to a certain certain spot in your leadership capacity no worries look uh, thank you Lockie for your time for those listening that was uh, Lockie Cook talking to me on the Emerging Leader podcast mate appreciate your time mate so great to um, you made me go real deep in a lot of these questions. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. <laughs> no and I'm like, I didn't even know I thought that. Um, but look forward to staying in touch and I uh, appreciate the chat. Uh, mate, it, it makes for uh, great listening for those that want to learn uh, something about the leadership game. So thank you again. And for those listening, this is Eric Perez from Talking Leadership. Thanking you for your time and I'll catch you all in the next podcast.